Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, y'all can be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, TC. TC did a fantastic job last week. It was something I definitely needed to hear, something I've been wrestling with a long time is how God uses His Spirit and works inside of our lives. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today as we're starting a new series as we're going to go through the Gospel of John. And you know, I'm real creative, so I called this series Life. I was going to call it the Gospel of John. So that was my creative piece, was calling it Life. Because as we think about the Gospel of John, we look through it. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's probably my, in my top two uh, I love this book. I love teaching through it. I love what it has to show us. And one of the things, one of the themes that runs through the Gospel of John is this word life. You're going to see it a lot. And, and it means something to us. We think about what TC talked about last week, about how we should, you know, lean into the Spirit of God and be able to listen to Him. This idea of life in, in the Gospel of John is just that. It, it's allowing God to lead us. It's It's a divine life. In the New Testament, there's three words that are translated to the word life. One of them is the word bios, which is translated uh, this idea of a worldly life. And it's used in Luke chapter 8, verse 14. It talks about how uh, they're spreading the seeds on the ground and the, uh, the, the word is choked out by the, pressure, the pleasures of life. That's the word bios that's used there. Another word that's used is this word where we get our word psyche from. It talks about our mind, our mind and our emotion and our will. It comes out of Matthew chapter 16. It says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life because of me will find it. He's talking about our mind and our psyche there. Well, the word in, in John that's used is this word Zoe. And it's completely different. And this word for life in the Gospel of John, Zoe, is about this divine life, eternal life, that you may have life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That life that he's talking about is a life that a Christian should live, like our life should be different. He talked about having joy in these hard times and, and through the struggles that we go through. That comes from having a life connected to God. I was thinking about that when he said that. When we, when we as Christians, let's say someone in our family passes away, like we, it's different for us, right? Because we, that person was a Christian. They put their faith and trust in Jesus. Yes, we're sad, but it's a different kind of sad in that uh, we know that they're in a better place. So, so this idea of joy, this idea of living a divine life, this Zoe life is a full life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So before we go there, I want you to think about uh, this idea of Zoe life. Think back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Before they ever sinned, that life, that communion with God, walking with God, talking with God, that relationship, that's the idea of a Zoe life. A, a life connected to Him. Unbroken fellowship. That's the idea of this uh, uh, Zoe life. I want to look at John chapter 10, verse 10. Actually, let me back up. Let me go to John chapter 20. This is at the end of the Gospel of John. John sort of tells us why he wrote this letter. So today's sort of introductory. I'm not even going to talk about John chapter 1, verse 1. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But I'm going to go to the end, almost the end. John tells us why he wrote this letter. So before we ever start, let's think about why he wrote this letter. And this is what he says in John chapter 20, verse 30. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Now here's what he's saying. We've heard about all these miracles that Jesus has done. There's way more than that. There's things that we don't even know that he's done. There's things that the disciples knew that they didn't even bother to write down. That's how many miracles and signs and wonders that he's done. And then he says this in verse 31. But these are written. John's saying, listen, I chose these specifically for this purpose so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, Zoe life, 
in his name. So here's what John says. As we start this gospel, the gospel of John, there is a purpose. So that you may believe. This, if you're a Christian, this book, as we go through it, this letter, should strengthen your faith. It should help us uh, be more strengthened in our faith and our belief and our trust in Jesus and what he did. And then maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is a great opportunity listening through this gospel to learn about who Jesus is so that you may believe. Because salvation comes by faith. And that's what he's talking about here. And it's not just belief in anything. He actually gives us some specifics here. He says, belief that Jesus is the Messiah. That he's the Savior. The chosen one. The anointed one. The predestined one. He's it. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So first of all, that's what our faith is in. Is that Jesus did what he said he was going to do. That he died for our sins. He's our Savior. Second of all, that he's the Son of God. And what's interesting about John is, John is going to make a case that not only is Jesus the Son of God, he's God himself. We're going to see the Trinity in the Gospel of John. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But, but it's that he's the Savior, that he's the Son of God, and that by believing in those things or having faith in those things, you may have life in his name. Not just eternal life, but life now. And, and that's kind of what I want us to think about today. But, but as you think about this Zoe life and you think about, okay, man, I'm all about having life and we should be people of joy. But does it always feel that way? The truth of the matter is sometimes my life doesn't even feel that way. It doesn't feel abundant, if you will, at times. So, so why is that? Why do we as Christians struggle to not find joy uh, shouldn't we be happier than other people in the world? But in a lot of cases, many people can't tell the difference. But, but John tells us a little bit about that too, and I want you to see that too because this is, sort of goes on what, what we're ultimately going to get to today. Look at John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says this. He says, A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. So I think about this verse, and here's what I think about. Number one, man, I would love to have life in abundance. What's he talking about there? Is he talking about being rich? No. Because many of these disciples, many of these people who followed Jesus, they gave up everything. Paul says, I count all those things that I, I got and that I gave up, I count them as rubbish compared to knowing Christ. See, what he's talking about here is this life of abundance is a life of fullness, a connected to God. Go back to that idea of Adam and Eve before the fall in a relationship with God. You know, quite honestly, my life doesn't always feel like that. And you know why? Because it goes back to the first part of this verse. There's a thief that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. There's, there's powers that be that work outside of us that want to take that away from us. And you, you know this. You've, you've been around people who are joy killers. You know, you, you don't even like to see them coming because they're going to say something negative. You're like, you, you walk around them. You see them coming, you, you go down a different way. There, there's, there's forces in this world that want to take away all your joy as a Christian. To steal, kill, and destroy. First of all, the, this, this enemy that comes wants you to never put your faith and trust in Jesus. First and foremost. Second of all, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, these enemies, these forces that go against us will want to steal our joy and make us be Christians who are not willing to share joy with other people. TC talked about evangelism and being able to share our faith. Okay, if you're going to be a Christian, the, the enemy wants you to be a Christian that's going to keep your mouth quiet and not pray and not do those things. And, and see, I think we as Christians, sometimes we've, we've got into this situation where we've let the, the enemy steal, kill, and destroy. We're just scraping by. Life seems to be normal. You know, our students are getting ready to go to camp. They leave in the morning uh, to go to Union University and if you've ever been on a student camp, I was a student minister for a long time. I love camp. It's a great time because one of the things you do at camp is you disconnect from the world for just a little while. I want you to think about how connected your teenagers are now compared to how connected we were when we were. We had like encyclopedias. Like who's, 
Who's doing that, right? But now teenagers need this, like they need this week to disconnect from those things and begin to focus on God and begin to focus on their relationship with God. But guess what happens when they come back? The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to distract you. And here's the thing about this enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Even for us adult Christians, we're in the same boat. We we have a hard time disconnecting. Is The enemy is not going to come right at us with sword and shield and weapons of war. No, they're smarter than that. See, the enemy distracts us even with good things. Even with things that we deem to be good and important. He can distract us. And it can harm the way we live our, this divine life. And it gets in the way. And, and, and that's what I want us to think about. But, but here's how that happens. Let's go back to Adam and Eve in the beginning. Adam and Eve, uh, everything was great. And God said, you know, you can eat of all these things. But there's these two special trees in the garden. There's the tree of life. Life. We're talking about life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And and the serpent comes, the enemy comes, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He begins to ask Eve some questions, and he begins to ask her about these trees. And when she answers about the tree, do you know which tree she answers about? Not the one that gives life. She answered about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know what that tells us? Is she was already focused on the wrong thing. She had the tree of life there, but she had already set her mind on the wrong things. And this is the way the enemy comes and tries to kill, steal, and destroy. You think about that tree. It was a delight. It looked good to eat. It looked good to us. And see, this is how the enemy attacks us. He wants to take us and so that we don't have that abundant life, so that we don't share the greatness about Jesus, so that we don't sing like we should sing when we praise and worship. Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, he's going to come at us with even some good things that will distract us from the greatest thing. And that's where we find ourselves. And see, this is a battle. And I don't know if you're this way. I'm just going to tell you the way it works for me. This is the battle that I fight every day. So I get up in the mornings. I get ready. And then I go downstairs to have my quiet time, and it's nice and warm. I sit out under the porch, and the sun's coming up over here, and the dog's doing whatever out there. And I'm going through my devotionals. I I do a couple devotionals. I'm doing one with Tony Lee right now and Dan, who's on the other side of the world. We do one together occasionally. i got a couple others that I do on my own. And then i got my prayer list, and I pray through it. And, And this is like my time to get with God and spend time with God. And here's the way the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy, this is the way he comes into my life. I sit down, I begin to read my devotional. You know what comes to mind? Hey, did you answer that email that that guy sent you yesterday? Hey, that meeting you got today, are you you ready for that? Hey, what what about Carson or Alyssa? Have you done this for them? And listen, none of those things are bad things. Like, my job is not a bad thing. But this is one of the ways that the enemy wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy, is to distract us with some things that, quite honestly, they are important. Your job is important. We as Christians should be good at our job. We should want to do a good job. But when those things begin to take importance over our time with God, that's when we begin to have a problem. And this is what happens when we look at this idea that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he came that we may have life and have it abundantly. The reason we don't have it abundantly is because we're allowing the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's distracting us with things that we're focused on the wrong thing, sort of like Eve in the garden. Think about it. Every morning I'm just like Eve. I'm, I'm there with my time to spend with God And I'm focused on the wrong thing. And it takes away from my time from him. And and what we've got to understand as Christians, we've got to get past this. So, So here's the question. Okay, we probably all have this same problem. We're probably all in this same boat. How do we get this abundant life? Like, how do we get there? Well, John sort of tells us a little bit about that. Uh... 
In, in John chapter 20, maybe you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. Like, that's step one. So in John chapter 20, when we read the summary of what the gospel of John was like, he says, I've written these things so that you may believe. So it starts with faith. John 3.16 says this. He says, this is eternal life. Or, or for God so loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Zoe, life. Faith. Like it starts with faith. That's step one. So if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, man, I encourage you to do that today. And then second step for us is as Christians, what does that mean for us? Second of all, it means for us faith also. Number one, it's faith important enough to know that God is listening when I pray and that God cares when I pray and that God cares about what I pray about. And faith is believing that God may even do something about it. Because if we don't believe those things, then why would we even pray? If we don't think he's listening, we don't think he's going to do anything about it, we don't think he cares, why even pray? So part of that prayer life starts with faith. And then we look at John chapter 17, verse 3. This is what Jesus says. He says, this is eternal life, Zoe life, that, you may, that they may know you. He's talking to God. He says that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent Jesus Christ. So here's what Jesus is saying. This life, this divine life, where we get that from is this personal relationship with God on a daily basis. That happens through prayer. It happens through his word. It happens through putting our faith in him. It, it, it happens to having an ongoing conversation with God throughout the day about those emails that you get. That, Did I answer? Or, what about this meeting? Give that over to God too. Don't keep your job and your, your Christianity separate. If you're worried about those things, take it to God. And, and this is when it begins to take over our whole life. When we don't separate those things like, like we are now. We have this personal relationship to know him. That word know there is the word gnosko. It, it's the same word that's used but how a husband and a wife know each other. That's a very personal relationship. Do you know that we can know God that way in a very personal relationship? But you know what? I know this to be true. And I've not gotten any amens today, maybe one. But I bet I'll get one right here. We know this because that relationship between husbands and wives, the same thing can happen. Wives, have you ever told your husband something and they weren't listening? Amen, right? They were thinking about that email. They were thinking about whatever it is they've got to do. And you're like, were you even talking to me? Right? You, you see how that, that in and of itself distracts from our relationship? The same thing happens with our relationship with God. It doesn't mean that you're not important. It doesn't mean that our relationship with God is not important. It's that, 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 that we have gotten distracted. We begin to focus on the wrong things. And, and that's the idea here. And then we, we, John tells us uh, through Jesus' words in John chapter 15, he, he begins to talk about abiding in him, remaining in him. If you read John chapter 15 for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But it talks about this vine and branch. That you are the vine and, and I am the branch. Or no, I got that backwards. You are the branch and I am the vine. And that when we're connected, we get life. And Jesus is talking about in that thing how we're to be connected to Jesus. That's where this life comes from. It's through this relationship. Do you know that when you cut a limb off a tree... It'll lay on the ground, and it'll actually look alive for a little while, but it's dead. Why is it dead? Because it's not connected. It has no life in it. The only place that it gets life is from its connection to the vine. This Zoe life that we want to live, this life of abundance, the reason we don't feel like we're living a life of abundance is because we've limited that connection in in my backyard we have three trees that are uh they're all maple trees they were all planted at the same time and two of them are big and huge and they're about the same size and then there's one that's about half the size 
and it looks like it struggles all the time. First, that's the one the dog goes to the bathroom on every time because it's right by the door. But second of all, to look at this tree and the root of the tree circles itself. Like the root literally comes out of the ground and it circles the trunk. So when the root grows, it actually shrinks the trunk. They call it root bound. So uh, that, that's our idea of this Zoe life. The reason we're not living an abundant life is that we have restricted our connection to God with things that even may be important. Well, what I did with that tree, I decided live or die, I'm cutting that root. If it lives, great. If it doesn't, it's going to die anyway. I actually cut that root and it began to split apart and now the tree's beginning to take off. And see, this is the idea. When we think about this idea of abiding and remaining, it comes down to this connection that we have with God. The reason we struggle to live that abundant life is we have not worked on the connection in our relationship with God. Jump down to John chapter 12 and Jesus tells us a little bit about this. This is the triumphal entry. This is Jesus's last time he's approaching Jerusalem. He's about to die on the cross and I want you to see what he says here because I think it's very important for us and I want to get to the final point here. John chapter 12 verse 20 it says, now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Verse 22, Philip and Andrew uh, went and, to, or Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus replied to them. So these guys want to see Jesus, but Jesus is focused on the cross. He's got something bigger in mind, you know, like redemption of the world, you know, payment for sins, those kind of things. He's got some... Things that he says this, he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now what we're going to see in the Gospel of John is Jesus uh, uses this love and hate thing in a particular way. It doesn't mean that he necessarily hates things. It's a, it's a comparison of how we love things. But here's what he's saying in this passage. In order for something to live, it has to die. I took a picture at the beach. Wayne, can you put that picture up there? I don't know if you can see this, but we had these palm trees. You can see right there to the right, you can see the big palm leaves hanging over. And it had these, I assume it was a coconut, I don't know, I don't know anything about trees, but it was green, uh, a big ball like that. Well, you can see that one fell off, and it landed right there in the ground and died. But look what came out of it. In order for that tree to reproduce, it had to die. Part of it had to die. And this is what Jesus is talking about right here in this passage. This this idea, one of the things we're going to get to early in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3, Jesus is going to begin to have a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus about being born again. This is a picture of being born again. And the reason that we struggle and the reason that we have a hard time Living the abundant life is that we've never really died to the old life. It keeps wanting to come back. That, that repentance, when we repented, we turned from going to life this way, and we're going to trust God and we're going to do these things. You know what? That old life still wants to come back, and it still wants to, to fight us, and it's still there nagging us. And it's because we've never fully died to it. A plant will not reproduce unless its seed falls to the ground and dies. And this is the idea. This is, what, this, this is what I want us to think about. In order for us to truly live that abundant life, there's some things that we're going to have to die to. And it's not that our, I'm, I'm telling you, hey, go quit your job. Like, I'm not going to quit my job tomorrow. I'm, I'm not telling you to do those things. But what I am telling us is that sometimes we put way too much importance on things that are not really that important at the end of the day. I I wasn't planning on sharing this, but you know, 
I don't know how long you've been at your company. Let's say you've been there 40 years. But if you retired tomorrow, you know business goes on, right? You know that they'll put somebody else in your seat within a month or two, and business will go on. What I want you to understand is that our relationship with God is more important than those things. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm not telling you not to be good at your job. What I'm telling us to do is we need to elevate where we've put God in our life. And we need to focus on that relationship with Him. and Block out that time to spend with Him. Because it's that important. So, here's what I want us to do. We think about this idea of what does that look like. Jesus told us this in another gospel. He said, it's something that you got to do on a regular basis. Because, you know, I, I struggle with this. I, I, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Andrew Murray. I try to read all his stuff. He's a dead guy that lived in South Africa. He's fantastic. I encourage you to read his stuff. But he, he wrote a book called Total Surrender. Because that's really what I want for my life. It's been several years ago. I read it at the beach. And... You know, I felt like that at the beach, I, I, like I, I want to surrender. Like I, I made this commitment to surrender. But you know what I learned? It, it's more than just making a one-time commitment to surrender. And you know what? Jesus really told us that. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is what he says. He says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, what? Daily, and follow me. That even though when I was at the beach and I read that book and I'm like, man, I'm going to surrender. No longer am I going to put those work things. No longer are they going to come to the forefront of my mind when I pray. You know what? When I pray, those things still come to the front, forefront of my mind. You know why? Because I have to pick up my cross daily and follow him. And here's what I know, that even preaching this sermon, you know what I'm going to have to do tomorrow when I get up and I go down there and I sit down there and I open my Bible and I open my prayer list? You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to pick up my cross again in the morning. And Tuesday morning, you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to pick up my cross again. And the next day, and the next day. And it sounds daunting, but you know what? The life that's on the other side is worth it. It's worth it when we begin to put things in the right perspective. And we do that early in the morning. We say, you know what? Today, I'm going to follow you. Yes, there's going to be things that are important. Yes, I've got to do these things. Yes, I've got to go to this meeting. Yes, I've got to return that email. But for this moment, right now, I want to spend it with you. And when we begin to do that, we'll begin to live an abundant life. It comes down to taking up our cross. So when I think about this idea of abundant life, I think about the, the enemy who wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy, here's my two pieces of advice for you. Number one, you got to eliminate some distractions in your life. Eliminate some distractions in your life. Teenagers, this week, you go to camp. You're going to be with less distractions. Use this time to focus on your relationship with God. Adults, we got to turn some distractions off. It's okay to turn the TV off. It's okay to put Twitter down. It's okay to do whatever. Take some time to spend time with God. You think about that tree in my backyard. Sometimes you've got to cut down what's holding it back. Take an axe to it because that's what it needs. And then second of all, you've got to take up your cross daily. These are the pieces that we're missing in our life. And the reason, we're not missing an, uh, the reason we're missing out on an abundant life is because we've not been picking up our cross daily and following Him. So that's my encouragement to you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask TC to come up here. I'm going to finish by reading a prayer to you by a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. It's a prayer that I've had in my possession for probably two or three years. And I look at it. Uh, on a pretty regular basis. I've been meaning to send it out to you guys in realm, but I think today uh, it, it fits well with what we're talking about today. So I'm going to read it to you, then I'll put it in realm for you later. But Leonard Ravenhill was an evangelist, and he was talking about the life of prayer. And he, he really talked about this idea of taking up your cross and following him. And this is, 
These two together fit, so I'm going to read this to you. This is what he says. He says, tell your family I'm starting a prayer life. I'm going to live for Jesus. Go home, take a clean piece of paper, write your name and date at the top, and write out what is wrong with your life. I'm lazy. I'm indifferent to the lost. I have no compassion for the lost. I have no vision. Life has no power. Lord, show me what is wrong with my life. You will be amazed at what he shows you, the things that have offended him. Tell him, I want to be crucified with Christ. Put to death everything that is unholy. Fill me as full as a human can be with the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to get rid of this bondage tonight. Get rid of your rights. Get rid of your right to criticize. Your right to be dry-eyed. Your right to be a failure. We know one thing about a man who leaves with his cross. He isn't coming back. Let us go to our own funeral. I think that's our prayer today for us. Is that it's time for us to take up our cross. And it's time for us to ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. The reason we don't live a Spirit-filled life is because we've got too much other junk in there. He wants to fill us. But we've got too much other stuff in there. It's time to lay those things down. Take an axe to it like that tree. Would you stand with me? John 17, 3 says this. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I pray today that we begin to know you like that verse talks about. Like a husband knows his wife. Like a relationship like that. God, I pray that we begin to know you and that we desire to have that relationship with you, that we begin to take an ax to those things that are distractions in our life, things that are unholy, things that are in your way, things that are restricting our relationship with you. God, I pray today that we take an ax to those things. And God, here's what I know. We're going to have to wake up every morning with an ax. We're going to have to pick up our cross daily in order to follow you. And I go, Lord, I pray that we become people today who do just that so that we can live the abundant life and that we will begin to uh, bear fruit as John 15 talked about. And the only way that we can bear fruit is if we die to ourselves. And God, I pray that if there's anybody here today who's never put their faith and trust in you, God, I pray that they do that today. That they want to know you, the one true God, and your son, Jesus, whom you sent. God, we look forward to this series in John. God, I pray that you teach us how to have life and have it to its fullest. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.